All right. Well, good morning, church. Welcome to Vision Church. If you're watching online, we're happy you're joining us as well. If you would go ahead and just stand, starting to get into the posture of worship, and we're going to pray and just welcome the Lord into this place. So, Father, you are welcome here. We invite you in, not only to this place, but into our hearts, God. And when we invite you in, we ask for your conviction. We ask for you to work in our lives in whatever way you want. We surrender to you right now, God. Asking that you will do what only you can do. And even if it's not what we want, God, we still invite you. We still ask that you would move and correct us and unite us as a church, as believers, as your children, as the family of God. That as we get ready to worship and as we get to lift up the name of Jesus and sing together, that we would come together and be united by the Spirit. And that your presence would fall in this place. God, that's what we want. That's what our prayer is, is that you would just fall and move in this place. That we've planned a service, God, but we want you to move us out of the way and have your way in this place. Let us believe the words that we sing. Let us cling to those words and those truths. And God, if we've came in here with heartache and heaviness on us, Help us to let go of those things to be able to worship you freely. And if we've came into this place with joy and fulfillment in our lives, let us not forget to, to realize that is all from you, that every good gift is from you. And so we give you glory, we give you praise right now, God. Set our eyes on you, set our eyes on Jesus who went to the cross and died for our sins and then resurrected in life, God. Set our eyes on this truth as we worship you and sing about you and study about you today. We thank you for this church, God. Have your way in this place. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
done for me and Jesus to fully praise you it would take all eternity it's just like Lazarus oh you brought me back
You're my hope and stay And when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay Cause Lord, I need you You're my righteousness, oh God, how I need Let's declare this together, come on. So Lord, I need you, oh I need you, and every hour I need you, my one defense. You're my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. You are my one defense. You're my righteousness, oh God, how we need you. Thank you. 
thank you for your providential hand over our lives, Lord. My God, as a church family, that we got to go through the book of Ruth together and see your goodness and your faithfulness in that story. And a story that so clearly points to your gospel and truly leads through the lives of those people the way for salvation for you and that bloodline to bring Jesus to us. And so God, we praise you for the wonders of your ways, for the intricacies of your ways that we could never understand. God, that you are above time, that you are above it all, that you are sovereign over all. So God, we can trust in that goodness, we can trust in your sovereignty, that you have a plan for your glory and our good. God, we thank you that God, the people in this place that know you, that call you Savior, that call you Lord, God, we can never be separated from this love, from this salvation. No man, no power on earth, no power in hell. God, the enemy can get in our ear and whisper that we don't belong to you, whisper that we are this or that we are that, or get these eyes in our head. But God, if you call us child, God, that can never be taken away. So we sing and we worship you for that today, God. God, that you are bigger and above it all. God, we thank you for this church family that you've brought into this place, whether God, they've been here for years since the beginning, or just a couple weeks, just a couple months. And God, you are growing your kingdom in this place. God, not for us to stay still, but for us to be your hands and feet, for us to bring your love and your gospel into our community. So God, show us more clearly the ways you want us to do that. God, we wanna be empty vessels to be used by you. God, as we open your word together this morning, God, I pray that we continue to worship. That's worship too. Worship isn't just singing. It isn't just prayer. But God, it is opening your word, believing that, that is your breath on a page, the final authority to the final say in our lives. So God, we cling to your word. God, we hunger and we thirst for it because it is you. God, we thank you for this place that your presence is here. And God, I pray if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, that doesn't get what we're talking about, God, would your presence be made known to them, undeniable. God, would they see and hear your gospel and accept it as truth, that they would repent from their sins and be transformed into new life. And that God, as a church family, that we champion them in that, that we pray for them, that we help carry their burdens through that. God, it is a beautiful thing that we are alive in Christ this morning. So God, we give you the floor to do what you want to do. God, have your way in this place. Speak in the way that only you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. If you would, go ahead and turn to Ruth 4 in your Bibles. I hope you have your Bibles with you. If you do not own one, we should have some, one somewhere in a row in front of you, under a seat in front of you. Ask somebody, can you hand me that? Um, and if you don't have a Bible, that's yours to take. You can have that. Uh, before we really get into this, this is the final week of this series. And before we dive into it, I just want to take a moment and honor our veterans. Uh, it's something we, uh, this year, just flying by. And this is one thing I want to stop and take a moment and Mark, uh, this last week was Veterans Day, and I, I just want to say thank you for your service, and, and 
It is because of men and women that are, that are willing, like you, to serve your country. Even people that might disagree with you or not like what you do, you still do it and you still did it in order for us to be able to come and meet in here right now. And so we don't want to take that for granted that we get to gather here and sing songs and worship and pack boxes and do fun things and missional things and, and worship Jesus openly because there are some very sacrificial men and women that gave their life, uh, some actually giving their life, but many that, that just put years into or whatever it was, if you've served at all in any branch of service, thank you so much. And so I want to ask you, you don't have to, um, once again, it's Veterans Day, so you shouldn't, or it's, we're celebrating veterans, so you shouldn't be forced to do anything you don't want to do, but if you would, and you are a veteran, or you have a loved one who has served in, in the military and you would like to stand in their place, I'm just going to ask that you would stand we want to honor you, and then we want to pray over you. So veterans, please stand. If you want to stand in the gap for somebody, a family member, daughter, parent, whatever it is, you want to stand in the gap for them, we just want to celebrate you and honor you and thank you uh, for how God's used you in your service, and we just want to pray over you. So if you'd all just join in, if you see a veteran near to you, you don't have to touch them, but if you just want to stretch out your arm towards them and this prayer of thanks. Father, we thank you for the sacrificial men and women. We thank you for these families that have had to sacrifice time with loved ones in order for them to go and serve and protect our country and our freedoms. God, we, we look at veterans and people that lay down their lives to serve people, and even people that might not like them, and it, we, we're, we can see such a, a relation to you and Jesus going to the cross that you died for us even though we were the ones putting you there. And so, God, we thank you to see the sacrificial love in humans and men and women that would love their country, love their families, love uh, you enough to serve their country and protect our freedom to be able to worship you the way we do now. And so, God, I ask that these veterans and these families feel blessed today. I ask that they feel comforted if there's people here that have lost loved ones that have served in the military. Comfort them today. Bless them today. Um, God, we ask that your honor would fall on them, that they would feel honored by us as a congregation, that they are uh, examples of your love, and that by honoring them, it is honor and glory to you, God, that you created them and called them to this service, and they have served you in doing that. And so, God, we thank you for them. We thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus setting that example, and we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, we we want to take a moment to do that. And, you know, a lot of times if you've came to our Friendsgiving dinner, we used to try to do that, and COVID's kind of complicated that. But when we would have our big Thanksgiving dinner here as a church, we would honor our veterans. Uh, but we don't want to miss it. That is very important. And so uh, thank you so much. All right, so let's finish this book of Ruth Strong. Y'all with me? We want to finish this strong. It's been an awesome. This is six, the sixth week now, and we, we don't want to start getting tired now, right? This is the home stretch. We see the finish line, and this is where all the energy we le have left, we burst towards the finish. We want to know what God's saying to us. We want to believe his word. We want to declare his word. And so finish this strong with me. Will you all do that? Uh, this has been a story that we've been studying of incredible loss and pain. We've talked about it from week one and week two, and, and you see it through the whole thing. There's loss, there's pain, there's struggle. And, and if you're like me, you've been waiting for today. We, we got a little taste of this last week, a taste of redemption, that we're like, this is what it's been all leading for. But this is the season finale. This is the moment where we tie all the knots and we wrap everything up and, and we cry and we celebrate that God is a, a redeeming God. And so this is what we've been waiting for. If you've been on this journey with us, if you've been reading along, if you've been coming to even just a few of the services the last six weeks, I hope that you felt on the edge of your seat that, man, there's got to be more. There's something happening. Ruth and Naomi's been on this horrible journey, but there's hope. And let's see if that comes through. And so this is where we are. We're, we're, we're on the cusp of redemption here. And I think the reason we, we feel this, we can't wait for this, is because we all long for redemption. It is what we all need, right? We, we need a Savior. We need, we need help, right? Like we, we need someone that can do what we can't do. And that's why when we watch shows and movies and things, and we see somebody that doesn't have it all together, maybe even the bad guy, and you feel that little hint of, I hope that maybe they'll turn good by then. I hope that they'll be redeemed. I hope that in the, in the very end scene, they'll do the right thing. And the whole time they haven't done anything right, but you're hoping in the last moment they do the right thing. Why do you feel that way? 
It's because that's what your hope is for you. Your hope is for you that even though you know deep down that you are a sinner and you have some brokenness in you and that you are dead in your sin, there's this longing that there has to be redemption. This can't be it. But you also know in yourself that you can't redeem yourself, that, what, that all the works you can do and all the goodness in you is not enough to be redeemed in your own strength. And so we long for a Savior. That is why we love the book of Ruth. It's because even though Ruth is faithful and she is strong and she is doing everything she can to hold her life together and Naomi and support Naomi, in the end, it comes down to she cannot redeem herself. She needs a redeemer. So a recap. We're just going to try to go through this quick. As I always say, go back and read the story. But the book of Ruth starts within the time of the judges. This means that nobody cared about God's law. And everybody did what was right in their own eyes. Nobody was listening to God's law. Everybody was cheating everybody. Everybody was doing whatever they wanted. Nobody cared about anything. And we say, hey, this kind of sounds like today, right? Like, it doesn't seem like even Christians really care about God's word anymore. We just do whatever we want to say, what we want to do, and what seems right to us. So this is the time of the judge. It's already a bad time. And Naomi's husband, his name is Elimelech, and then she has two sons, they move away because of famine. They're trying to find food in the land of Moab. And then her husband, Elimelech, and two sons, they all die. And basically all she's left with is her daughter-in-law, Ruth. Her other daughter-in-law, Orpah, stayed behind in Moab. Ruth was faithful to Naomi and returned to Bethlehem with her. Now here's the thing. Ruth is a Moabite, so she's a pagan, but she trusts the Lord. And it's evident from her first step of faithfulness to Naomi saying, I'm going with you and your God will be my God, that she serves the Lord. And then she meets this man, his name's Boaz, it's a providential meeting. She just is out gleaning in the field, trying to pick up the scraps so that her name, Naomi do not starve. And she meets this man named Boaz, he's the field owner. He's a worthy man, meaning he owns a lot of land, but he's also a worthy man. One of the few men that still obeys God's law when everybody else doesn't. We find out that Boaz is a kinsman redeemer. And what that means is that there's no men left in Naomi's family, in Elimelech's family, that they basically are hopeless. Women in this time without any man, a son, a parent, or a husband were hopeless. They couldn't own their land, really. They couldn't take care of it. They, nobody looked at them like they were real people, and so they had no hope. And so what they need is a kinsman redeemer. This would be a family member of Elimelech that could then come in, marry Ruth, and continue that family line to preserve Elimelech's name. And Ruth asks Boaz to marry her in a very strange way, if you were with us. Seems weird. Culturally, they would understand. Ruth asks Boaz to marry her and redeem her. Boaz says, but there's another re redeemer that's closer than I. And he goes and sets up this meeting and talks to him and says, hey, will you redeem this? Buy this land from Naomi and fix everything. And he's like, I'll do it. He's like, another thing, Ruth the Moabite comes with it. He's like, I don't want her, so no, I will not do it. And Boaz jumps up and says, I want to redeem her. I will do it. I promised her I would, and I will. And this is where we see God's story all come together. That there was providential meetings happening, and there's, we're in Moab, and then we're in Bethlehem, and there's a famine led us there, but then bread brought us home, right? And so, like, God's been working and moving the pieces around, even in people's bad choices and bad mistakes that they made. Elimelech made a bad choice to leave Bethlehem and go to Moab. God was able to work through that and use it because he's God. Right? And so all through all of this, God is working and weaving his character and his story all pointing to Jesus, and this is where it all comes together. So look at verse 13, Ruth 4, verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. And if you're like me, I'm like, come on, this is God. This is God. The, just, just a chapter ago, there was no hope. There was no redemption. There was no Savior. There's no hope of anything. Just a, just a couple pages back, and Ruth and Naomi's life is over, and now we read that Boaz marries Ruth, and then not only does he marry her, they have a son, which is really where the redemption happens, because it's by the son that the family line is preserved and saved. 
This is what we've all been waiting for. All this pain, all of this suffering, all the struggle and the hunger has all been leading to this. To me, that is just beautiful. Because we look at the pain and the struggle, and when you're in it, when Ruth's in it, when Naomi's in it, you don't see how can anything good ever come from this. And you might be in that right now. You might be listening online and saying, that's how I feel. That's why I don't, I'm not even coming to churches, because I don't feel like there's really any hope for my situation. Well, they didn't think there was either, but God can do miracles, and God can make a way, and he can author a story out of junk, right? Out of a mess story, right? Like, he, like he's the one that takes all of this, you know, this horrible junk, and, and he turns into this most beautiful story that we're saying, man, no human could even write this beautiful of a story. It says God is the author. And if you're taking notes, I want you to put right this first point down. Very, very simple, but it's so important. God extends grace. And you might be saying, yeah, grace of God, amazing grace. We know that God has grace. We know what that is. But I, I don't want us to move past this. I want us to see in the story how God is extending grace here. Notice what it says in verse 13. It says, the Lord gave her conception. You know, all that's from God, it, it, all that we have is from God. It is grace. It is a gift. Your children, your job, your money, whatever it is, it, it is a gift from God that God extends grace. And, and what I love about this is the author, I believe, notes it in this way that the Lord gave her this child. The author notes it in this way to remind us that this child is a gift of grace. Listen to me. It's not owed to her. She does not deserve it. God's grace is so good, he extends it to her and gives her a child. And I want us to hear this because this sounds harsh, but God did not owe Ruth anything. It's harsh, but it's true. See, see we, we do this because we're humans and we relate to humans in the Bible, and it's hard for us to relate to God because he's God, right? But we look, read this story, and if you're like me, you see Ruth's faithfulness. You see how strong she is, how resilient she is. And we start to feel that, man, God owes this woman a happy ending. He owes it to her. She's been faithful. She's done everything, basically everything right. Like, God better fix this. God owes her this happy ending. And I want us to hear, no, he doesn't. He doesn't owe us anything. He doesn't owe Ruth anything. And you might be saying, well, that's just kind of mean, and that makes God sound mean. It's not mean, because here's the thing. He doesn't owe us anything, but he gives us everything. That's what makes him so good. He extends grace to us. He does not owe Ruth to be redeemed. He does not owe Ruth a child, but he does it. Because God is good and full of grace. It's only by God's grace that he not only saves Ruth, but he provides for Ruth. He sends Boaz to redeem Ruth, and now he gives a child to Ruth. Now, before we get this twisted, I want you to hear, yes, it is true that God blesses faithfulness. Be faithful to God's word, be faithful to him, doesn't mean your life's going to be perfectly easy, but God blesses faithfulness. It's just a truth in his word. But he does not owe you blessings or owe you grace. He deserves all the glory. We deserve nothing but hell. But man, God extends grace. And so we celebrate this as we look in this story. Not only does Boaz marry Ruth, but then he gives her a child, extending grace upon grace to her. See, if we think because we're faithful, God owes us something, we miss the whole point of grace. Because if you walk around thinking, man, I deserve this. I've been, I've been to church, and I've only missed like one week in like the last six months. And, you know, I've been doing this, and I've been giving more. And, I've been, and, and when you start doing that, you're missing the whole concept and the beauty and, and the joy of grace. The, the beauty of grace is that it's not fair, right? It's not something you earn. It's not something you deserve. It is grace. That's what makes it grace. So everything you have in this life, every breath in your lungs is God extending grace to you. Every morning you wake up is God extending grace to you. 
See, God extends grace not because of who we are and what we do, but because of who he is and what he does. I, I don't, I, I, he, God's not down. It's like, Nathan's done pretty good. Here's some grace. Like, that's not the way it works. He, God, God's like, Nathan is a wretch. He is a sinner and a messy, messed up person. But I am God, and I am good, and I am loving, and I am kind, and I am full of grace and mercy. And because I love Nathan, grace. And that's why we worship and celebrate and shout and we're excited because that's how good grace is. And if we diminish grace and we do not understand the power of grace by thinking we earn it, man, it takes all the power away from it. It is a gift of God. Now I'm going to quote a verse here. And before you all get excited, I just want to say this verse I believe is the most taken out of context verse in the Bible but I believe it applies here, and we'll work around it. Jeremiah 29, 11. You're like, woo! That's my life verse. Uh, it, it's a good, right? It's scripture. It's good. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. You can probably memorize that maybe in a little bit different, but that, that, that's the idea, and we see this on paintings, and we see this on pictures and posters, and, and you know, it's in our bio of our Instagram, right? Like, we, 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 we love this passage, and it is such a good passage, but it's so taken out of context because who this is applying to in the Scripture, God declares this, I have plans for you, and they are going to be good, but not right now. The people he's planning for are getting ready to go through some of the worst things in their life. But he's saying, listen, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. You've got to look towards me. Trust me. There is a hope. There is a future. It might not seem like that right now or over the next few years. But I promise you, I do not forsake my people. There is a hope and a future, and it is in me. And so that's what, and I see, look how clear that fits into Ruth's story. Like, I want to be clear, this verse does not mean you get everything you want. But it does mean that God does have a plan. See, God's plan for Ruth's life was not her plan for her life. Her plan would probably have been that her first husband would not have died. And her father-in-law would not have died. And they would have stayed in Moab. And they would have survived and had children. That was her plan. That's not what happened. And so... This is the situation where if somebody would have came up to Ruth when she's in the pain and struggling and said, listen, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you. God loves you, and if it's not good, then there's something wrong. Like, like that would have crushed her. But if we look at this scripture in context, it's saying, listen, there is a plan, though. You're not just lost. You're not just stumbling down a hill because life stinks and it's beating the tar out of you that God knows the plans he has for you. And they are plans of welfare and not evil and to give you a future and a hope, but it kind of takes a way to get there sometimes. And so Ruth could look back now as she now has a husband and she's been redeemed and has a son and she could say, man, God had a plan. He had a plan the whole time. And I look back at my life and I see the, the providential meeting of me and Nikki ever meeting. It, sh it doesn't make sense. We shouldn't have been at John A. at the same time. And I look at different things that happened and the way it was all designed. I'm like, man, God, you're good. You are really good. Like the way God plans that. And at the time I was like, I didn't want to be back at John A. But I wasn't sure what I was going on with my life. Like God has a plan. And it might not be your plan. And in fact, it's not your plan. This plan for Ruth took loss, pain, and sacrifice. But this verse says that God then gave her a child. And this child would lead to a hope and a future, not just for Ruth and the family of Elimelech, but for you and me. You want to talk about God's got a bigger plan? Like Ru Ruth's plan for her life was most was very just them, right? Like, and this is where we are as humans. I'm like, my plan for my life is about me. And it's about me being comfortable, my family being comfortable, and just surviving, right? Just, just getting through life. God's plan goes way beyond you. God's plan is way more than what you could ever imagine. And it's not about you. It's about so many other people. 
And that's hard for us to understand because we're humans and we're like, but I just want to be comfortable. Ruth was very uncomfortable and went through so much. But because of this path and this story leading to redemption through Boaz, we get a son that would lead to Jesus. God's plan is bigger and it is better. Sometimes harder, usually harder, but better. So let's look at verse 14 here. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a Redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age, for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child, laid him on her lap, and became his nurse. Second thing, God restores life. If you're taking notes, God extends grace, but he also restores life. You feel like everything's crumbled. You feel like everything is ash, right? Like everything is crumbled. God restores. It is just who he is. God brings life, right? Like when we were dead in our sin, done, life, right? Like that is who God is. God restores life. God is the God of restoration and redemption. Things are broken beyond repair in your life. Well, God can restore those things. Like, like, like God brings beauty from ashes. And here's the thing. Ash only comes when something has been burned to the ground, when something's been through the fire. So we say God brings beauty from ashes. Well, where do you get the ash? When life stinks, when life is crumbling, when you're crumbling, when it feels like you are in the fire. That's what brings about ash. And God says, I make beauty from ashes. If we look at 1 Peter 5, <clears throat> 10 and 11 says, and after you have suffered a little while, and we say, why? Why? Why does that have to be in there? But, but, but there's an after, right? And after you have suffered a little, while, a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Why? To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. So be it. Let it be. Like that, 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 this is beautiful because it not, it doesn't lie to you. There's going to be pastors and people that warp scripture and they're going to lie to you and they're going to say, hey, listen, everything should be great and everything should be perfect. And if you're doing everything right, everything should be good. Here's the thing. This verse is, doesn't lie to you and it is so truthful and good for us because after you have suffered, there's going to be suffering. If you're living for God, there's going to be suffering. There's going to be hate. There's going to be persecution. And it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. Like that just, that's, the Bible tells us so. But he who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. This is good news because we get to see the end. God tells us the end of the suffering. So for us, if you're in the suffering, if you're in the struggle, if you're in the pain, sometimes caused by your own bad decisions, sometimes just caused by life, you can look at the scripture and say, listen, but there is an end. There is an after that involves res restoration and strengthening and establishing. I want to note something here. We're talking about God restores life. Well, I want to ask the question, did Naomi get her husband and sons back? No. But she does get the peace that God used all that pain and all that loss to bring about restoration and redemption and this child. And I know that doesn't make it all feel better, right? Like if you're in that, you're like, hey, that's good. There's good that comes out of it, but I'm still in mourning. And that's what I want you to know. There's going to be mourning. And God's not like, hey, come on, get over it. It's all good now. I fixed everything. Like, he knows there's pain. He knows you're human. He knows you're going to struggle and be mourning. And he mourns with you, and he cries with you, and his heart breaks for you. He's not saying skip over those things. He knows Naomi is always going to have some loss in her life. But God is so good that he can tell her, hey, listen, but now I'm faithful to my promises to you. There is a child and he will bring about restoration in your life. See, remember what Naomi said back in chapter 1? I'm going to jump back there real quick. Flip too far back. Chapter 1, verse 
20, she said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly, bitterly with me. What did she say? I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? That's what Na- where Naomi was. I left full, husband, kids. I come back empty. Now, now here's the thing. That if you're Ruth, I'm sure Ruth understands, but Ruth's standing beside her like, what am I, like chopped liver? Or like, like, like yeah, you, you, I'm not, I know I'm not your husband. I know I'm not your kids, but like I came back with you, and she's talking to all the ladies. Yeah, this is Ruth, my daughter-in-law. I'm empty. I have nothing anymore, and Ruth's been faithful to her. Now, Naomi's struggling, right? Like she, she's hurting, and she's, she's at a loss. She doesn't even probably know what to say to these people. And they, 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 they saw her leave confident. She knew where, they knew where the bread was, and now she's coming back empty. She says, I went away full, and the Lord brought me back empty. But what does it say now in verse 14? Then the women said to Naomi, we don't know if these are the same women. I want to believe they're the same women that she was saying, telling, telling that the Lord brought her back empty. The Lord said to Naomi, or the, the, the women said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you has not left you this day without redemption, has not left you uh, just on your own. And and I love that we went from the Lord, I went away full and the Lord brought me back empty, to the women celebrating and glorifying God, knowing that this is all the Lord, and saying, blessed be the Lord who has not left you. And Naomi knows this. Naomi's like, the Lord hasn't left me. He's been with me the whole time, even when I couldn't see it. The Lord was there. It says, this child will be a restorer of your life, will be a nourisher to you in your old age. And then says this, Ruth, your daughter-in-law, is more to you than seven sons. See, seven is a biblical number of perfection and completion. In this time, if you had seven sons... That would have been the biggest blessing. You would have been the most blessed person in in the world. If you had seven sons to to branch off into seven different family lines to carry your family name, you would be the most blessed person. And these women have the audacity to say, this one Moabite daughter-in-law woman is more to you than seven sons. Why? Why? Because by God's grace, Ruth had proved to be an even better gift. Ruth is faithful in the avenue by which God would bring about this child and would restore Naomi's family was through Ruth. See, see, this is the thing. Man says seven sons is the best, right? Like that's what's going to fix everything. That's what we need, seven sons. God says, I'll take a pagan woman. Like, I'll just take, I'll take a Moabite woman who nobody wants, nobody cares about, and I will make her, by my grace and by my power, more and a better blessing than seven sons. If you put them up, you want one son or one, one daughter. I want a son. That's what people would say. Seven sons versus a Moabite woman. Nobody wants that. God says, I want that. And I will use that to be a better gift to Naomi and this family than seven sons. And then it says, Naomi then takes the child, and it says she became his nurse. She helps raise him. Honestly, some commentaries think that maybe she basically did take him as her own and, and raised him, and, and it was hers. But this family, they're tight, right? Like, like, Ruth is faithful, and she's already promised Naomi, where when you die, I die. Like, where you were buried, I'll be buried. So we know they're close, but Naomi gets to be a part of this child's life and raise him. And I want you to notice this and influence him. This grandma has influence in this child's life. Why? Because Naomi has a lot of wisdom in her life. She's seen the bad. She's seen the good. She knows the, the, the truth of who Yahweh is and, and better than Ruth probably does. Now, now, Boaz would know a lot too, but she gets to have, Naomi gets to have an influence not only to raise and help take care of, but to influence this child. And I just want to take a moment here to to note this. Listen to me, grandmas, grandpas. 
you have influence in your family. That, you, that even if you don't get as much time as you want or whatever it is, you get to set the example of faithfulness to God. Even if it's not being set anywhere else, grandmas and grandpas get to step up and be that. So be that. You're not done, right? Like people, like, don't think that because you're a grandma or grandpa that you're, you're well, my time parenting is over with and stuff. Uh, you get to have influence in your grandkids' lives and your great-grandkids' lives. I love that it notes is, why did it tell us that Naomi then takes and helps raise him? Because I believe God wants to give us a little wink and a little a nudge of encouragement to grandmas and grandpas. You have influence. You're not, your, your time's not over. God still works through you and uses you. Let's look at verse 17 here. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron, Hezron fathered Ram, Ram fathered Amenadab, Amenadab fathered Nashon, Nashon fathered Salmon, Salmon fathered Boaz, Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. And normally we look at genealogy and we're like, this is kind of boring. This is genealogy that should get us excited and hyped when it says it led to King David. Why does that get us excited? And the third point, if you're taking notes, God accomplishes his will. God accomplishes his purposes and his will. You're not going to stop him. God accomplishes his will. This family line led to King David. And we're like, man, that's awesome. David was awesome, right? Like, we love studying David. He was a flawed man, but that's part of the reason we like him is that he was a man after God's own heart, and he was a great king. And so we're like, man, King David kind of fixed a lot of their problems that, that Israel was having at the time. So we were like, yeah, that's awesome. King David, it led to King David. And so maybe that's what the whole purpose of God was doing here, was leading to King David. But if you know your Bible and your history, you know that it doesn't stop with King David, but it's by the line of King David that we get the Messiah, Jesus. If you can, jump over to Matthew 1. We're like, New Testament? What? Matthew 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Minadab, and Amenadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of who? Obed by who? Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. We're like, okay, I know that part. Well, instead of going through this whole thing, it takes a while jump down to verse 16 and Jacob the father of Joseph the husband of Mary of whom Jesus was born who is called Christ and then it goes into the, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way we're getting ready to go into that season and celebrate the birth of Jesus but I want us to see here is that we're talking hundreds of years difference hundreds of years apart we can go all the way back before this to Abraham. Thank God. Like, we look through the Old Testament, we're like, there's some weird stuff happening in here. Ruth seems pretty weird at times. Why is that weird stuff in there? Why is the weird stuff important? Because it is God providentially weaving the story together in order to have prophecies that Jesus would fulfill perfectly. These prophecies be in the line of King David. Like, we, we see this. This is all pointing to this. So not only in the story of Ruth do we see God's faithfulness and his redemption and his salvation, but it also is a story that leads on to King Jesus. Jesus. This whole crazy story led to Jesus. This is God's providence. It wasn't by chance. And it Jesus or and God wasn't playing catch up like, okay, well, okay, um, now they're moving back to Bethlehem, so I gotta call the angels in. We gotta have a board meeting, and try to fix this. Like he, they're not like a writer's room where they're trying to figure out how to rewrite the story to make sense because an actor left, right? Like God, God's not freaking out here. God's like, no, this is my plan. And he's not shaken, and he's not sturdy, he's not freaking out. God's like, man, this whole crazy story is my crazy story. 
to accomplish my will and my purposes. Good news for us, God has a plan, and his plan is always accomplished. And not to, I don't want to make this about you and me because that's not the purpose of this, but I do want to encourage you that God has a plan for you. We, we, we talked about that. For I know the plans I have for you, and, and sometimes they're really hard. There's a lot of joy in them. There's a lot of sacrifice in them. But God sees you, and he does have a plan for you. And I guarantee his plan for you is less about you and more about other people and, most importantly, Jesus. That your purpose for existing is for the glory of Jesus. It is to share the gospel. And I want to note that what it took for you to be here. If we look at Ephesians 1, verse 7 through 10, it says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. I love this because it wraps it all up. There's redemption, there's grace, there's you. Why? To bring all things and unite them all in him for his glory. That is why we exist. That he's got a purpose, he's got a plan, but it is not, it's not about you. It's about him. That God is about God. Yes, he is full of love for you and grace for you and you're his children and he cares about you so much. But God is about God. And that's not being selfish or prideful. It's he's God. And so you exist to bring him glory. I'll close with this, just because I, I just think this is amazing. And I saw this being shared around. You might have saw it too, but I just wanted to, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. It would take forever, but just to fly over. For you, I'm talking about you, for you to be born today, it took 4,094 ancestors over the last 400 years and that's just going back 12 generations. 12 generations leading to you, not counting before that, over 4,000 people. For you to exist and be sitting in this room or at home right now. And it's not a fluke thing. It's not by an accident. It's not just because, well, that's just the way the world works. A man and a woman, they get together, they have kids, and they have kids, and they have it just by an accident. You're not an accident. And, and that's what blows my mind is because there's 4,094 ancestors just going back 12 generations. That is 4,094, like, like if you think about it, all the providential meetings that had to happen. Like your parents had to meet. And God led them together, and they might have met in church. You never know. My parents met in church. That's pretty cool, right? And, and, and then you go back to the grandparents. How did they meet? And then their grandparents, and then it branches out and branches out and branches out. That every single one of those people, God knew and was thinking of you and knew you would come because God is outside of time, and he's providentially putting these people together to walk into that school or to change schools or to move to a different town or to move across the country because the family's a military family or whatever it is that led to you. You cannot tell me that's an accident. You are not an accident. And so what I want us to get from this is I'm not like you to be like, wow, that's pretty awesome that God would do all that to make me exist. It is awesome. But once again, it's not about you. That God had all those providential meetings just as he did in Ruth's story to lead to you for a purpose. And so I want to encourage you, church, don't waste it. Don't waste your life by worrying about things that aren't important and worrying about what people think of you and worrying about what's going to happen next and tomorrow and stressing yourself out. God led all of this to happen for you to exist right now in this time, in this church, in this town. Don't waste your life that God has a plan for you and a plan to accomplish his will through you that there's people that want need to know the name of Jesus and his love for them and his grace for them and God wants to use you 
for that. And God wants to use you to be an ear to listen to people that are hurting. He wants to be, use your resources that you've been blessed with to give and care for other people. That God wants to use you. Do not waste it. We get it just a few short years on this planet, right? And I don't want to end the rest of end in my life, whenever that is, be sitting on my deathbed thinking, you know, I, I'm going to be thinking about what I wish I had done, what was most important. It's probably family stuff and telling people about Jesus. So if we can recognize that now, that God extends grace to us that, we, that is undeserved, and that God is the restorer and redeemer of our lives and our stories, and he wants to accomplish his purposes and his will through us. And as we celebrate this story, it's not a story that we just talk about in church and then forget about. It's a story that we carry with us and we carry our testimonies with us. Church, don't waste your life. God does have a plan. It's not your plan, but it is the better plan. And He's going to accomplish His will. So I, I just kind of want to say, okay, God, I surrender. Like, use me. I know you're going to do what you want to do, but I want to be a part of what you're doing. And so we're going to pray. I know we've covered a lot of stuff in, the, in this book, and we covered a lot of stuff even just today. But that's kind of what I want to lead us into prayer with today, is that we, we don't want to waste our lives. We don't want to waste this church, that God has placed this church here, not to just come in here once sun, a Sunday morning once a week and just do this. Like, he, we exist to be His hands and His feet and to be used by Him to accomplish His will. So we pray, God, what is your will? I surrender to it. Use me. So maybe that's where you're at. Maybe that's where you need to be praying about now. It's like maybe I've been wasting my life a little bit, and I've been thinking a, lot, a little bit too much about me and not enough about God and what he wants to do. Maybe you're just struggling through life, and you feel like Ruth, where you're in the fire right now. You're in the struggle, and you don't see the other side yet, and you're trying to trust God that there is an after part of this. There is a better part. Maybe you need to grab somebody's hand or pray with somebody. They want to uh, pray with you, and we believe there is an after. We just don't know when that is, so the hardest part is in the waiting. And maybe you've never trusted Jesus before, even watching online from home or wherever you are. You've never trusted Jesus. I pray right now would be the moment that you would understand the love that Jesus has for you. That you do exist. God sees you. He created you and he brought you to this time right now for a purpose. And the first purpose is he wants to save you and he wants to redeem you and restore you and give you life. And so if you would just trust in him, believe that Jesus went to the cross for your sins, died in your place, and then resurrected. If you could put your faith in him and that truth that Jesus is alive and he loves you and he walks with you, I believe he will save you. And so we're going to pray. We're going to have people down here to pray with you if you need that. If not, just grab somebody's hand next to you. Um, pray where you're at, whatever you want to do. But let's take the next few moments um, and, and just seek God. Father, we, we seek you now. We're running towards you right now. God, that you are our hope, you are our redemption, you are our joy, you are our life. And so, God, let us not forget that. Right now is a very busy season for so many of us, God, so help us to set our eyes on you. That you are what is most important, and being used by you is what's most important. God, we know that there's not one person that's an accident, even if someone told them they were. But you are above all of that. And from before creation, you saw us and had a plan, starting with Adam and Eve, leading to Abraham, leading to Ruth, leading to King David, leading to Joseph and Mary, leading to Jesus the Christ. Would come into this world, would be Emmanuel, God with us, would grow up, be sinless, be crucified for us to forgive us of our sins. God, you have a plan and you had a plan you will accomplish it, and we praise you and thank you for that. We know that you have a plan, God, and we know that the enemy has a plan. We know that your plan is accomplished and his is not. 
but even though he knows he's going to lose, he does as much damage as he possibly can. And so, God, we thank you that your plan is accomplished and his isn't. And even when he's causing chaos, we set our eyes on you and we trust you. Even in the fire, even in the struggle, you are with us and you are good. God, have your way in this place. We're going to seek you. We're going to pray. Meet people right where they are, just as you always do. We thank you and we pray this in Jesus' name.
for what it is, God, a free gift. Not something that we can earn or that we deserve, but something that is so freely given through the power and the cost of your blood in the cross, Lord. God, we thank you that you extend grace over and over again. God, over our failures and our mistakes, our shortcomings, for all have fallen short for the glory of God. All have sinned, Lord but you extend grace to us anyways. And so God, we praise you for that today. How do we thank you that you are not finished with us yet? No matter how young or how old, God, you have a plan. And so God, we submit to your plan this morning, even when it's hard, even when we don't understand, even when we wish that the suffering part was already over, already passed, or would never happen at all. God, we submit. God, our sense of control over our lives back to you, Lord. We give it to you. And we put it all in your hands, knowing full well that everything is for our good and for your glory. So God, work in our lives. God, give us that sight of eternity. God, to see your purposes in the waiting, to see you working, even when we can't feel it, to believe it. And God, as a church, would we be a part of your plan? Would you open our eyes to see the way that that will unfold? And God, even when we can't see around the bend, we don't know what's next. God, would we be faithful? And God, would you give us grace for us when we mess up? Because we will. And God, through the power of your spirit, God, would you strengthen us, God, to overcome sin to overcome the temptations in our lives and the sin that so easily ensnares. God, give us your spirit to combat it, to defeat it in the name of Jesus. God, we thank you for this place. God, it's a beautiful thing to worship with fellow believers, brothers and sisters in Christ. So God, we thank you for what you're doing in this church, what you're doing in this place, what we see you doing in our community. God, even though we might live in a time where people do what's right in their own eyes, God, would we still keep believing your word and your truth in fullness as the final authority. God, that we are faithful when others are not. So God, continue your good work in this place and God, use us to do it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And church, thank you for being here with us today and worshiping with us, whether you're watching from online right now or you're listening a few hours from now or you're here with us today it is our honor and a privilege to worship with you and um, just a few things to go ahead and note um, if you have questions about the gospel questions about Jesus about membership about serving we always need people to be serving and make Sundays happen and make all the things we do here at Vision happen please fill out an online connect card you can find a link for that in the bio of the live stream and it's always on our website visionchurchsi.com if you call Vision Church your home and you worship through giving we have texts to give we have giving online all that good stuff and of course we have the box here at the church um, I think the main things to make note of is one we just want to say thank you to everyone who gave to operation christmas child um i don't know yeah go ahead and clap you guys are so generous um every year we you blow us away with the way that you give and the way that you guys show up with the boxes um and again today was the last day to turn them in so i hope you got them here um but we're going to be sending those off um, and the main thing we want to go ahead and do is tammy's going to pray with us over the boxes we're going to pray in agreement with her um we believe that a box can change a life and we've seen that happen through different stories and testimonies through samaritan's purse um, so we want to pray over these specific boxes and that these kids feel the love of jesus um, through the way that you pack them with your family and the prayers as they're sending um don't take just today and um, this morning together to pray for them be praying about them as we go into the christmas season um, and whose hands they will land in um, so tammy if you want to go ahead 
Uh, if you want to reach your hand out towards the boxes, that's fine. Let's all pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, God, for this program, Lord, with that Samaritan's Purse created, Lord, Operation Christmas Child. And we thank you especially that we get to be your hands and feet, Lord, and serve these children all over the world that are going to be getting these boxes. And Lord, right now, I pray for each child that's not only get, going to get one of our boxes that we sent, but all the boxes that are being filled across this nation today. Lord God, we pray for them. We pray that when they open these boxes, that they will feel joy. And most of all, Lord, that they would feel the love of Jesus because we've packed them with the love of Jesus, Lord. Yes. And so, Father God, I pray in that, that the workers that pass them out, Lord, we know that they teach them about Jesus. They give them books. There's programs they go through. So we pray, God, that their hearts will be turned towards you, that there will be salvation in their lives, God, and you're raising up these people through this, uh, these children through this, God, to be warriors for you, Father. So again, we thank you uh, for the opportunity. We thank you for these children and ask that you bless them, Father. Clothe them, feed them, Father, and give them clean water. And Father God, we thank you for each person who participated. Ask that you bless them. And Lord, we know that next year that we're going to get to do it again. So we ask that people be praying about that now, God. And we thank you, Father, for this ministry. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so again, thank you guys for filling those boxes. Thank you guys for being here. And this wasn't planned, but I do want to encourage you, um, as we get into the holiday season, things kind of just have a way where we're like, oh, well, this is surely Thanksgiving week, so we'll surely talk about thankfulness. And this is Christmas, so we'll surely talk about that. But as we approach the Sunday that is, you know, around Thanksgiving, I want to encourage you, as Nathan was talking about grace, and that that grace is fully given, that it's a gift. Um, throughout this week, every morning as you're praying, it's, there's nothing wrong with telling your needs to God. That's an important part of prayer. But to start it with Thanksgiving, start with thankfulness, think of something that maybe you take for granted, and start with that every day. And um, because Sunday, we do want to worship with thankfulness. We want to come in here and be be excited so get yourself in that mindset already in that spirit of thanksgiving as we get into that week um, and we'll try and remind you to do that on social media maybe share with us kind of what you're thinking what you're thankful for this week um, but again thanks for worshiping with us church and we'll see you next time